All right, I'll be reading from The Arm of the Starfish by Madeline Langle. This is chapter 15. Before Adam could make any response to this outburst, Callie whispered, Here comes Daddy. Hush. Typhoon Cutter looked even more like a spider than Adam remembered. It seemed incredible that this obese ma mass with the stringy appendages could possibly be father to the beautiful girl at his side. Then the boy remembered the portrait of the angelic young man and wondered if Callie could ever be anything but young and radiant and lovely. She pressed her fingers quickly against his, a gesture that was both in intimate and warning. Adam did not return the pressure, and her look flickered quickly over him like a flame. Of course, Typhoon Cutter was saying, all the rooms have balconies overlooking the ocean. And our guests, in a primitive setting, nevertheless have every modern convenience. Callie explained, Daddy's part owner of the hotel. They walked through a rooftop bar and lounge, Typhoon Cutter gesturing expansively with one thin arm. I think our service can compare with any of the great hotels in the world. We'll stay up here and cool off before going down to dinner. In the lounge, long windows opened to the terrace, and there were groups of com comfortable chairs and couches around low tables. The walls were painted with lush murals of native of the native village, so glamorized that it was a moment before Adam recognized it. The mud and straw huts, the fishing vessels, the natural harbor, all were enlarged and garishly ornamented. And the natives themselves were elaborate lays and looked more as though they came from a tourist dream of Hawaii than a primitive island off the south coast of Portugal. In one corner of the room was a huge television set around which a group of young people was clustered. The volume was on high. Without looking round, Typhoon Cutter raised his hand and snapped his fingers, and a uniformed page went running over to the set and adjusted the dials. At one of the low marble tables sat a solitary man in a dark suit. Adam could see only his back, but it looked somehow familiar. Doc Mr. Cutter turned toward him, saying, Dr. Ball hopped over with us. His busy schedule doesn't permit him to get away often, but he's badly in need of rest. We're flying him back tonight, since of course he can't be away over Sunday. Adam said nothing. Silence, as a matter of fact, was his plan of campaign. To look naive and innocent and gullible, not too difficult, he realized ruefully. To be swift to hear and slow to speak. He caught Callie looking at him anxiously, then glancing away as her father turned toward her. Adam felt a hot surge of resentment. He had enough on his hands without coping with a confused Callie. If she tumbled into the, to the fact that her father was a stinker, she'd have to work it out her own way. Dr. Ball rose as they reached him, shook hands effusively with Adam, and kissed Callie. Adam found that he enjoyed this latter even less than the handshake. Dear boy, Dr. Ball murmured, lowering himself into his comfortable chair. How delightful to see you again, and in less hectic circumstances than our first meeting. What will you have to drink? He indicated his own glass. Get the prospective victim drunk or drugged. Adam thought aloud, he said. I'm not thirsty, thanks. Kelly put a hand lightly and briefly against his knee. The bartender has Cokes. I'm going to have one, Dr. Ball urged. Do join us in our libation. Okay, a Coke then, thank you. Adam realized that a uniformed boy was hovering by Typhoon Cutter waiting to take their order. Mr. Cutter nodded at the boy who went to the bar. Now Adam, Mr. Cutter said, when I last saw you, when last I saw you, we had a, reached a certain understanding, had we not? Adam said nothing. You did agree to help me, did you not? Adam tried to look blank and made a slight gesture of his head that could have been interpreted either as an affirmation or a negation. An edge of impatience came to Mr. Cutter's voice. I believe that I made it reasonably clear to you that I am in a position to be useful to the embassy and that I feel that it is my duty to my country to help out when I am called upon. Yes, sir, Adam said. You were understandably tired, but you did agree to help. Yes, sir. I would consider it my privilege to help them at the embassy. That seemed to be a nice double-barreled response. The embassy, being in his mind, Joshua. Good. 
Dr. Cutter's voice spun upward, a high, thin, plausible web. At that time, I am referring to the time of our first meeting, my men, in order to inspire your confidence and ensure your cooperation, went to a great deal of trouble and not a little danger to rescue the O'Keefe child from the very organization to which her father belongs. A great man, but you know how stupid scientists can be. I may say that I personally underwent danger. Our enemies are ruthless, so ruthless indeed, that they do not hesitate to use an innocent child, a child of one of their own members, for, pur for their purposes. He paused, waiting. Adam knew that a further resp response was indicated here. I've only been with Dr. O'Keefe a couple of days, and everything's all secret and hush-hush around me. Just what are their purposes, sir? Now Dr. Ball leaned forward, his well-manicured hands spread out on the table. You have spent these two days in working, in working for Dr. O'Keefe, have you not, lad? Well, yes, sir, but are you aware of the nature of his experiments? Well, to some extent, sir. I mean, I knew before I ever came, Mr. Cutter asked sharply. You have actually been working with the starfish? Well, just cleaning tanks and simple jobs like that, so far. Dr. Ball put his hand on Adam's knee. It felt heavy, very unlike Callie's leaf-like gesture. Adam felt his skin crawling. His eyes, he raised his eyes to the hand. He raised his eyes from the hand to the immaculate white dog collar and to Dr. Ball's handsome, smiling face. Adam, dear boy, the doctor said, lifting his hand and passing it over a dark, well pomaded hair. Do you realize what I you do realize what O'Keefe is doing, don't you? Well, yes, sir, working on the regenerative process of the arm of the starfish. In the starfish, Dr. Ball sounded as though he were in the pulpit, Adam thought. And in certain other specified beasts. This is a perfectly natural thing. O'Keefe is taking it beyond the point of nature, but not only is he usurping the prerogatives of the Almighty, he is then allowing his work to get into the wrong hands, hands soiled with a taint of sin. Adam tried to imagine Canon Talos saying these words. It didn't work, he mumbled. I'm afraid I don't understand. Un-American hands, Mr. Cutter said. Hands that do not have their country or its economy at heart. All Adam could think of at this point was that hands do not have a heart. He shook his head slightly to try to pull his thoughts together. This time, he did not have a lack of sleep as an excuse for not being alert. The young waiter put two cokes down on the marble table, a fresh drink for Dr. Ball and a drink for Mr. Cutter. The bartender evidently knew, without being told, exactly what Mr. Cutter wanted. Adam, Typo Cutter said in his soft, tender voice, I am a very wealthy man. I admit to you perfectly openly that I enjoy my money. Dr. Ball broke in, but you are a generous man, a very generous man. That's, that's not the point. I try to do what I can, of course, and if I have been able to be of some small service to you, it gives me great gratification. Eliphas, Dr. Ball, is on the boards of several hospitals and orphanages and old people's homes, as well as attending meticulously to his regular parish duties. It's catching, Adam thought. Even Mr. Cutter's beginning, even Mr. Cutter's beginning to talk in Dr. Ball's pompous pattern. Perhaps Typhoon Cutter realized this, for he cleared his throat before saying, All I'm trying to tell you is that although I enjoy my money and the things it can buy, my country comes first. In fact, I love my native land so well that I am willing to live outside it, in voluntary exile, because in this way I am better able to serve. I have been asked by people who must remain nameless to find the results of Dr. O'Keefe's work and get them into the hands of our own government before unscrupulous agents grab them. But sir, Dr. Er, Adam said, trying to sound innocent and reasonable, Dr. O'Keefe is an American. 
pink, Dr. Ball murmured, tinged, alas, with scarlet. Standard tactics, Adam realized. Accuse those who might well accuse you before they have a chance to get in a word edgewise. Adam, Mr. Cr Mr. Cutter asked, how much do you care about your country? Very much, Adam answered with complete honesty. Would you make a sacrifice for it if necessary? Yes, sir. Here again, he could speak with a ring of proof. Dr. Ball asked, do we have your word of honor that you are willing to work for your native land, no matter how difficult it may be for you personally? Yes, sir, added Adam, mentally, and I'm quite sure that doesn't mean we're not for you. It's Dr. O'Keefe who cares about the things you're talking about, not you. You're, you're nothing but a witted sepulcher, whited sepulcher. Mr. Cutter put down his, put his glass down with a click. When do you think you'll, you can get back to Lisbon? Well, I, I think I could manage it this next weekend. Dr. O'Keefe would have, Dr. O'Keefe would have the tennis papers ready by then. It would be time for him to go. Make a date with Callie. Well, yes, sir. That would be my pleasure anyhow. Callie smiled at him and he managed to smile in return. Arrange to meet her on Friday. The hotel taxi service schedules a routine Friday morning flight. By then, you should know more about O'Keefe's work, and so that you have more than my word to go on, that I have my country's rather than my own interests at heart, you may bring your information directly to the embassy. Oh, good, Adam said with deliberate innocence. I have a friend there. I could go right to him, Joshua Archer. He turned and smiled at Dr. Ball. He's a good friend of yours, too, isn't he? Dr. Ball forced a toothy smile. Yes, indeed. Indeed, yes. But O'Keefe's work is too important to... If the ambassador himself is busy, we'll see to it that you talk to someone very close to him. This is nothing from your underlings, no matter how delightful they may be. This is, a, this is more than a patriotic duty, my son. It is a very big opportunity for you. It may make all the difference in the world to your entire life. Yes, Adam said. I know. Come to me at the rectory as soon as you reach Lisbon, Dr. Ball said. Perhaps that would be easier for you than braving all those formidable secretaries at the embassy. Mr. Cutter rose. I'll have instructions waiting for you at the rectory. We'll go downstairs for dinner. The air conditioner works passably well in the, in the coral room. I don't know what they're what they do with the air conditioners. Must get an investigation going. I'll order some good American food. I imagine you're tired of these Portuguese messes. Drink up, Cali girl. Adam must be hungry. The coral room, too, went in for murals. These, Adam gathered, were meant to be of Manhattan, though it was only a faintly recognizable Empire State Building that told him this. The artist, if he had ever been to New York at all, had seen it in the last in the had seen it last in the days of the elevate elevated <laughs> one enormous wobbly structure ran right by what appeared to be the main branch of the public library. Since there were two lions in front of the parade building approached by an enormous flight of steps. The fourth wall was French windows leading out to the tennis courts, the pool, and finally the ocean. Adam sat between Callie and Mr. Cutter at dinner, and across from Mr. Ball. Mr. Cutter ordered steak and French fried potatoes, a salad with Thousand Island dressing. That all right with you, Adam? Oh, well, yes, fine. Anything he could agree with legitimately was fine with him. There was no longer the slightest question in Adam's mind as to who was serving his country, Mr. Cutter or Dr. O'Keefe, and there had never been any question as to who was serving God, Dr. Ball or Canon Talis. The critical moment Joshua had predicted had definitely been, been passed. There could be no more looking back. He had chosen sides, whether he liked it or not. At, that, at the moment, he found his immense surprise that he was liking it. At the moment, 
he found to his immense surprise that he was liking it. A new kind of excitement surged through his veins. He felt tingly and alert from toes to fingertips and ready to go. There was only one hitch, and it was an unexpected one. Callie's anguished greeting had doubled all the complications. He knew that if Callie needed him, he could not reject her plea for help. Joshua said that his side cared about the fall of the sparrow. Callie, in her frantic cry, Adam, as Adam climbed out of the helicopter, had become a sparrow. But how to help her, he pondered as he chewed his rather tough steak and kept one ear on the conversation. He tried to think what Joshua would do. Joshua would not turn away from anyone who needed him. That was the first thing. After that, he would probably play by ear. Adam, hope, Adam only hoped that his ear would come close to being half as true as Joshua's. What he must do now, he decided, was to manage to sound suspicious about Dr. O'Keefe when Callie was out of the room. He felt a surge of anger. His whole business about Callie was off the schedule entirely. He had written her out of his life, except as the daughter of the spider, and here she was, a new and unwanted responsibility, and a sparrow instead of a spideress. Canatalis had put polymnia, polyhymnia in Adam's charge, and he muffed that one. Here, out of the blue again, he was being handed another problem and this time he must not goof. He wondered if Dr. O'Keefe would have sent him off to dinner at the hotel if he had known that this was what was going to happen. Joshua, in playing by ear, seemed to have perfect pitch. Adam wasn't at all sure that he himself wasn't tone deaf. After dessert, he had the chance he was looking for, Typhoon Cutter said, Adam. We adhere to the rather old-fashioned custom of the gentleman's lingering over the port for a brief respite after dinner. We'd be delighted if you'd care to stay with us. You can join Callie in a short while. I believe she has some idea of a moonlight swim. Thank you, sir, Adam said. I don't think I'll have any port, but I'd love to stay and talk if I may. Callie sent him a stricken look and he added, We'll have time for a swim, too, won't we? Typhon Cutter moved his ponderous head so that the folds of his pink flesh rolled over his immaculate shirt collar. Certainly. I've arranged for the helicopter to stand by to take you back whenever you're ready. There isn't any hurry at this end, at any rate. When Callie, reluctant and pouting, had left, and the port had been brought, Sir, Adam asked, looking from one man to the other, this Dr. O'Keefe. Yes, Typhoon Cutter asked. Typhoon Cutter asked. Well, sir, Dr. Didymus, the man I worked for before, you know, he's no slouch, but he didn't, well, well, what, lad? Dr. Ball asked in the gentlest voice. Well, sir, I know it's been only a couple of days but all I've done is scrub the lab floors and clean the tanks. I mean, junk anybody could do. I haven't been doing things like that since I was in seventh grade. I mean, it's not all over twist kind of stuff exactly, but it certainly doesn't challenge my mind, and he keeps the files locked, and I have a feeling... A feeling, Dr. Ball prompted. Well, he doesn't trust me. Dr. Ball said smoothly, It's probably not personal, son. I don't think Dr. O'Keefe trusts anybody. And if a man trusts no one, then he cannot trust God. I've been very careful, Adam said. I mean, I've been very discreet. I've just done my job. Whatever he's asked me to do, no matter how silly. And I've kept my eyes open so that I'm getting some idea of what's going on. What, whether he wants me to or not, he paused, frowning slightly. Dr. Ball raised one pale hand. Under these circumstances, my son, do you think you will be able to get to Lisbon next Friday? Well, yes, sir. Mrs. O'Keefe wants me to do some errands. I mean, shopping, 
knitting wool and stuff that absolutely anybody could do. And they did say something about the hotel plane. After all, I could have used my mind more if I'd stayed with Dr. Dimas in Woods Hole, no matter how old he is. Typhoon Kidder Cutter shifted position in his chair, the top heavy body swinging cumbersomely. Don't worry, we'll give you a chance to use your mind. Yes, Mr. Cutter, I hope so. You know what your instructions are? Yes, sir. I'll fly over to Lisbon on Friday, ostensibly to do some shopping for Mrs. O'Keefe. I'll manage to wrangle permission to have a date with Callie to give me the extra time I'll need. I'm to go right to the rectory to dock the ball. How, Typhoon Cutter asked slowly, will the idea of a date with Callie be received? Well, they know I like her, sir. After all, she is very attractive. I mean, any red-blooded American male. And after all, they gave me permission to come here tonight. I mean, it's not as though I were in prison or anything. It's just that the work I've been given seems kind of silly for someone with as much background in marine biology as I have. Typhoon Cutter poured more port. Reasonable precaution on O'Keefe's part, isn't it? Well, yes, Mr. Cutter, I guess it is. All right, Adam, you're a bright lad. Now's your opportunity to use that mind of yours. Keep your eyes and your ears open. You will be able to bring us some information, won't you? Yes, I think so. Be careful not to arouse suspicions. What you don't accomplish this time can be done next, though we don't have all the time in the world. Remember that. I'll remember. If you want your swim with Callie, we'll excuse you now. She'll be waiting in the lounge. Make your arrangements meet to meet her on Friday. Yes, Mr. Cutter. Dr. Ball smiled again, rubbing his hands. Be gentle and understanding with her, dear boy. She's a particular pet of mine. Yes, sir. It's been very nice to see you again. He turned with equal courtesy to Typhoon Cutter. It was a wonderful dinner. Thank you, sir. Just the ticket. He shook hands with both men, first the steel grip, then the pale fellow well met one. Until Friday, Dr. Ball said softly as the boy left. Outside the dining room, Adam breathed deeply. So far, so good.